I'm really delighted to be here. Now, when John Nash heard that <coughs> I was going to um, give up my reporting job in the New York Times for the night professorship, as in the night litter newspapers, he told everybody in Princeton, well, Sylvia's going to be teaching in night school. <laughs> so, um, but um, it's been a great, a great experience, and I'm really thrilled to be here and extremely honored. I, um, I um, love people like, like Alice Worland who are interested in, in looking beyond our own borders and seeing what works and what doesn't all around the world instead of only referring to our own, our own history. Now, having spent 10 years writing about something that the, even the Wall Street Journal says most Americans hate, that is economics, I feel that I should tell you at least one Russell Crowe story. Um, right after Ron Howard uh, screened the movie um, for, for me, I uh, he had already John and Alicia had already seen it, so I called them up in Princeton, and John came to the phone, and I said, so, how did you like the movie? And he said three things. First, he said, it wasn't slow. He only goes to action movies, so um, we don't go to the movies together. Uh, second, he said, he liked the fact that it was funny, and it was didn't have wonderful humor. And third, he said, and Russell Crowe looks a little bit like me. <laughs> <laughs> and I say about Russell Crowe that anybody can turn game theory into a story that three guys who walk into a bar is indeed an economic genius. <laughs> so what I'd love to talk to you about today is the economic genius the beautiful minds who invented modern economics. An economics not about what you couldn't do, but an economics about what you could do. For the bottom nine tenths of humanity, the world has changed more in the last century than in all the 2,000 years before that. The idea that the bottom nine tenths of humanity did not need to be slaves of dire necessity is so new that Jane Austen never entertained it. When she was writing it, at the height of the Industrial Revolution and the movement toward globalization that was sweeping the world at the 1800s, Britain was becoming a great deal wealthier. But the material circumstances of the typical Englishman, that is, the typical citizen of what was then the richest country in the world, were no better than those of a Roman slave 2,000 years earlier. His shelter consisted of a windowless, one-room dwelling, shared, of course, with many, many other people, and often animals. His heat, when he had it, was a smoky fire. His clothes were the ones that he was wearing on his back. He traveled no further than his feet could carry him, and medical care and education were beyond his means. The fact is that when he was not actually starving, he lived in chronic fear of hunger and death by hunger. This was life at subsistence. This is how animal species live. They subsist. What is more, and this is really the, the, um, the relevant, Point. No one saw 
any prospect that the future, at least the future on this earth, was going to be anything but a repetition of the past. That is, his children and his children's children and his, and his great-grandchildren would live just as he did. The station in life was dictated not by his own efforts, but by a deity or by Darwin or nature. When a loyal retainer died in Jane Austen's village, he or she might be praised for, quote, having performed the duties of the station of life in which he had been pleased to place her in the world. In that world, everyone knew his or her place. And except for the most extraordinary individuals under extraordinary circumstances, very few people could realistically hope to escape. The year 1842 was probably the worst year in the worst decade of the 19th century in England, it's called the Hungry, the Hungry Decade. When Charles Dickens returned from his American book tour in a very bad mood because we, of course, were the China of the 19th century when it came to respecting authors' copyright. Um, when he came back, England was in an industrial depression, there was joblessness, hunger, misery, and a great deal of strife, even a whiff, although not more than a whiff, of revolution. Now, true, in the years that intervened between the Napoleonic Wars and the 1840s, the bottom nine-tenths, that is, the working people, um, had made some gains. They did enjoy more freedom. The laws, levies, licenses, the time, the lower orders to particular villages, occupations, and masters were uh, either eliminated or, or loosened. Social mobility was greater. Uh, John Stuart Mill, a rather newer character, uh, said that uh, praise the fact that human beings are no longer born to their place in life, but free to pursue opportunity. Yet on the whole, this freedom was viewed, especially by the thinking Victorians, the middle class that was socially concerned, it was viewed with anxiety and foreboding. People wondered, and it wasn't just the radicals, but even arch-conservatives, the kind of people who, like Thomas Carlyle, who would have welcomed back the reinstitution of slavery and served them, um, they wondered if England was suffering from a Midas curse. And radicals like Marx asked, what use? is political or economic freedom if it's merely the freedom to starve. The world as they saw it continued. I mean, here we were at the height of the Industrial Revolution, uh, globalization in full swing, but the founders of political economy were filled with a deep-seated melancholy. For them, the world was governed by immutable laws, the law of population, the law of diminishing returns, the iron law of wages that dictated that population would always outrun resources, as it has since time immemorial, and that while the nation's wealth could be enlarged by technology and trade, it would be at the expense of the poor and certainly not to their benefit. Even Mill, who 
was a libertarian, a socialist, a uh, defender of uh, women's rights. Even Mill said, doubted <coughs> that the Industrial Revolution and all the new freedom had produced any improvement in the lives and material circumstances of Englishmen. Hitherto, it is questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day's toil of any human being. And, of course, a great many people were convinced that this society, that this modern society, could not survive. Charles Dickens was um, incapable of sharing such pessimism, um, incapable, almost temperamentally, of believing that all the awful things in the world were doomed to stay the same. And of course, he had just come back from touring a country in which, as he said very grouchily, thousands of millions of acres of land is yet unsettled, and a population with the custom of hastily swallowing large quantities of animal food three times a day. So Dickens felt that the misery that he witnessed when he came back from America was not necessarily a necessity of nature. He was bent on striking a blow for the poor, so he poured out the story of a rich miser who discovers that the world is indeed more abundant than he had hitherto thought and has a change of heart. It's a story that, like, um, like all good journalists, uh, Dickens realized that a story might have uh, an impact like a sledgehammer 20 times the force of a political pamphlet. The Christmas Carol is, if you read it, in the light of the debates of the day, which were about whether it was okay for government or private charities to aid the out of work and distressed workers. Christmas Carol is an attack on the fatalistic economics of the day. And Dickens insisted that not only was human ingenuity turning, making it possible, making abundance possible, but he called for a new economics that recognized this, an economics of possibility a science with a little human bloom, a little human warmth. He never uh, invented that economics of possibility, nor did Henry Mayhew and many other Victorian novelists, art critics, and intellectuals who saw that uh, such an economics was needed. But he, he recognized its, its real significance, its importance, because he starts his most famous novel, David Copperfield, with the famous question, a question that really couldn't have been asked in Jane Austen's time. And that was David's question of, whether he might become the hero of his own story. So for Dickens, Dickens was calling for economics that would, uh, that would change the world in a way that the nine-tenths of humanity that had been um, condemned by poverty to 
lies not much better than a high-grade livestock. That they could have lives, that they could be the heroes of their own stories. And this idea, the idea that humanity uh, can and would uh, take charge of its material circumstances, that things that were considered throughout the ages to be immutable and dictated by God or nature, that these circumstances could be influenced and changed. And this is one of the most radical ideas of all time. It was born in Charles Dickens, London, and this new way of thinking spread from there, from the 1840s, spread outward like ripples in a pond, until today, there is no place on earth where that idea is not embraced and it is still spreading. By 1869, something extraordinary was happening. And for the first time in history, for the first time in history, the living standards of average men and women were actually rising, not jumping up in one year only to fall back in the next, but cumulatively, permanently, and not by tiny, tiny increments, but if you look back over a generation, over 10 or 20 years, by leaps and multiples. Now, if you told anybody that in the middle of the depression that followed the panic of 1866, they might have been astonished because the, what was evident to observers, journalists like Henry James, the American novelist and journalist who came to London to, like everybody else, to study where society was going and in particular to ask how much improvement could the bottom nine tenths expect, if you had said to anyone that they were living in the first time in history when, when ordinary people were experiencing real gains, they would have looked, they would have been very surprised because, because there was a recession, there was unemployment, and in fact, the economic distress and social conflict, which gave rise to the, the fighting 60s, um, was a lot more visible than, than this slow progress and was radicalizing young university graduates. Alfred Marshall was uh, one of those who were so radicalized, uh, one of those who um, was inspired to become, like a whole generation, not missionaries in China or some other far off place, but missionaries in their own land because they saw so much that had to be done. He was destined for the evangelical ministry. He was the, son, he was the product of the lower middle class, which in England was much, much, much worse than being in color um, from a social point of view. And he became, by turns, a mathematician, a philosopher, and ultimately the inventor of the modern economics, the cheerful economics, the economics of the possibility that is now, uh, that is sort of our, our economics. By 23, he had escaped genteel poverty, he had become a Cambridge Don, he had become a gentleman. Um, and yet, because of the, the social
looking into the faces of the poor, the sight of so much want amid so much wealth. I remember that when want and poverty were universal, it didn't strike anyone as noteworthy. It was only when it was framed by all this new wealth that it looked as if it was not a necessity of nature. The sight of so much want. Why, I wondered, should you not make every man a gentleman? And what Marshall was talking about is why shouldn't everybody have a life like me? A life that allows you to some leisure, that allows you to educate your children, that allows you to choose what you do so that you are not simply working like a piece of burden. Now, these were the fighting 60s, the time of the Reform Act, the spread of franchise, of course, not to women, but uh, the spread of franchise to uh, uh, people without poverty. And Marshall and others were troubled by the contrast between the ideal of full citizenship and the degradation that prevented most Englishmen from taking full advantage of their civic freedoms. Not surprisingly, when he shared his uh, somewhat utopian notions with his uh, older and wiser friends at Cambridge, they told him he better learn some political economy, and so he studied the founders of political economy. He was found their power of their reasoning very compelling, but he couldn't accept all of their assumptions. He thought that they were assuming that many things were frozen that, in fact, were fluid, subject to change, and that they failed to take into account the possibility of the cumulative effect of evolutionary change. True, the poor were poor because the economy did not produce enough, and not only because some men got richer, well, the rest remained poor. And he accepted that uh, it was necessary to expand production if everyone was to have a chance at a life of their own. But he, dis he disagreed and thought they were wrong in assuming that wages that is, the living standards of ordinary people would not rise with the expansion of productive power. Now, Karl Marx, who was a contemporary, and in fact in that year had finally gotten over his writer's block and finally finished the first volume of Capital, Karl Marx never set foot in a single factory Capital. Albert Marshall, on the other hand, who was a kind of a ivory tower kind of personality, spent months every year studying, visiting, interviewing, studying every branch of British industry. Um, and reached very, very different conclusions from most of his peers. While they tended to see firms as instruments of exploitation, Marshall saw something different. He saw them as the means for raising the average standard of living by raising productivity. He saw that competition was forcing managers and owners to constantly look for new ways to do more with the same resources, i.e. increased productivity. And he saw that with that increased productivity, firms were hiring more skilled workers and paying them more. So he showed 
that there was a dynamic that resulted from the same competition that, that was forcing companies to do more with the same resources, also forced them to compensate, compensate workers and that in share the higher production. So that was that was the ingenious mechanism at the heart of this modern commercial system that was producing what were year to year incremental gains, but looked at over a period of time, truly revolutionary gains, unprecedented gains in the average standard of living. Now, the question for Marshall and most thinking Victorians was, was would, you know, would all this competition, all this freedom lead to, um, lead to a horrible society that was little better than a jungle, uh, with no rules, you know, where the strong preyed on the weak, and what good, what guarantee was there anyway that individuals, all these individual choices that were now possible, whether it was the former farm labor who could now leave his village and go to London uh, to look for a uh, day labor job, or whether it was the freedom of um, some of uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's uh, heroes to start a business. Uh, how do you know that?
quite fit into that. Um, she craved, uh, she got to know Herbert Spencer, the great, uh, probably the most famous uh, um, philosopher and scientist of that time. He's more famous than, than Darwin. And um, she decided she wanted to become a social investigator, that is, a scientist of society. Of course, it implied that she might have been a spinster. But then she had this competing desire to be the wife of a masterful and, of course, very handsome, rich, and powerful man who happened to be Edward Chamberlain. And the other day, when I was at the Bronx Botanical Garden, um, but walking through the greenhouse and uh, looking at the orchid show, I was reminded of this amazing thing. A Beatrice was madly, madly in love with Chamberlain, who was, to say that he was patriarchal and autocratic and a male chauvinist, and, you know, even by the, by the you know, standards of that day would be an understatement. And he was showing her his greenhouse and he put up, which he was very proud, and he wore an orchid in his buttonhole every day. He was an incredibly looking <coughs> and uh, uh, elegant man. And um, so there he is showing her around. She's you know, young, rich, beautiful, and then in love with him. And he said, well, how do you like it? And she said, well, actually, I prefer wildflowers. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, she wound up with Sidney Webb, was short and just not handsome, but very, very smart, and she did fulfill um, her dream of um, becoming a social investigator, but much, much more, because by the time Beatrice had, had morphed from being this beautiful um, uh, debutante to being a still very gorgeous, um, and very fashionable, she was really into shoes, a uh, middle-aged woman, she had uh, invented the think tank. Everyone who was anyone in, uh, in England, anyone who had any interest in social or economic policy, uh, went to the West every week, um, either to be seen there or to see others there. Uh, she had invented the idea of the modern welfare state, the state that taxes the most productive members of society, the rich, to um, guarantee a minimum level of a minimum standard of living for every citizen. A radical idea. And not only did she um, develop that concept, but she took under her, she mentored the man who first put it into practice in government, through legislation, before, well, many years before the New Deal, and even more years before the welfare state that the labor government introduced after World War II. And that was Winston Churchill. Okay, in the liberal government of 1908. It was a, um, a remarkable achievement for a woman who, when she was at her most depressed, having lost Chamberlain, not having you know, any hope of a career, um, uh, compared the bitter, talked about the bitter cry of the 19th century woman, and compared her position, even though she was wealthy and a very privileged poor woman, to that of the average worker. So by 1913, the average Briton was living twice as well as his uh, predecessor in Charles Dickens' day. And not only, not only were wages higher, but the government, the British government, was now, now actually beginning to embrace the notion that it was responsible 
for economic well-being and security of its citizens. And Beatrice, I just want to say one more thing about her, which is that she was no uh, sentimental um, um, idealist. She was very, very hard-nosed. She was the daughter of a very successful businessman. And when she brought to her marriage and you know, all of the work that she and her husband, who was a Fabian socialist, did was this vision and executive ability. Um, and she recognized she did not sell the welfare state on the grounds of charity, all the other wonderful things, the brotherhood of man, uh, or is it prevented against an inoculation against socialism. She sold it on strict supply side principles. One third of the English population was so impoverished that uh, they couldn't work, couldn't serve in the military, and so impoverished that their, their children's poverty was all but guaranteed uh, because they couldn't, uh, couldn't afford to do without the labor of, of their five and seven year olds. And her argument was simply that if the government, by taxing the most productive uh, and, and raising the living standards of this bottom third, that the nation would get a payoff much, much bigger than that cost in taxes in the form of higher productivity. Okay? So everyone would be better off. It was a um, a brilliant argument, which uh, which um, you know became which won the day. Um, Joseph Schumpeter was a very different character. Some of you may have heard of him as the um, the Viennese dandy who uh, used to brag to his students that he had had three objects in life. The best horseman, the best lover, and the best economist. And he let he said, "Well, I've only succeeded, in <laughs> and I'll let you guess which ones." Um, so he was very different from the rather puritanical and deep anorexic uh, Beatrice. Um, and but he grew up. He was also younger, and he grew up taking for granted. Um, taking for granted um, economic and political freedom, technological miracles, rising living standards, and even the um, even the welfare, or as he called it, the tax state. Um, by the time he was 23, he was also very enterprising and entrepreneurial. By the time he was 23, he had a law degree. He had uh, uh, made a name for himself as an economist. He had married an English woman, uh, 12 years older, and he was on his way to Egypt, which was then the, which was the China of the turn of the 20th century. In other words, the it economy, the, econ the miracle economy, the economy that was zooming out of its terrible past and growing rapidly richer, the way China is today. And the question that, that Schumpeter um, was asking, um, was obsessed by, was what drove, you know, what drove economic growth and really economic evolution because he, he recognized economic theory, the existing theory, of which he was very respectful, um, that existing theory treated 
economies as if they were merely cloning themselves, when in fact, as he observed in his own country, and you know, then in Egypt and elsewhere, they were changing, they were becoming more, uh, their structure was evolving, they weren't getting bigger, their workers were getting more productive, industries were more specialized, they developed financial systems that were very sophisticated. Um, so, and he wanted to know, A, what is the driving force because, because the ultimate question is, can this last? Okay, can this ingenious mechanism, whatever it is, that's producing these radical changes in the world, uh, of which he approved, can it last? So, um, so he, went to, he went to Cairo, where he spent a year and almost died, some fever, um, and he wrote a book in which he basically um, turned Marx upside down. Um, the, the traditional story Okay, the story that Marx, who has to be credited for recognizing the drama, the enormity of globalization, of technological change, of the movement from you know, agriculture and rural uh, economies to cities. Um, the story that Marx, who is the only economist who really talked about this dynamic process, the story told uh, really had no people in it. There were no individuals who were cast. This was Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. And Schumpeter had a, uh, a very different idea. Schumpeter had a very different idea, and perhaps it was had something to do with the fact that he himself started out more or less with nothing. He, he took the position that it wasn't resources, it wasn't territory, it wasn't population that made countries richer. It was, wasn't what you had, it was what you did with what you had. And the distinctive feature of this modern economy was incessant innovation, which of course also implied his, the phrase for which he's most famous, the perennial gale of creative destruction. In other words, he's doing all these new things and shifting to all these more productive things and uh, more valuable things you're also uh, destroying the traditional ways by which you made your living. Now, the difference, where he really departed with Marx, was that the prime actor was not technology, because as the Schumpeter who traveled around could see, technology could be, you know, imported, exported, spread around. I mean, anyone could buy it. Um, that didn't explain why. Some economies were developing and others were not. Well, he focused on the human element and the central character in his narrative, i.e. his Prince of Denmark was the entrepreneur, the individual whose function was to revolutionize the pattern of production by exploiting an invention or more generally than untried technology. He had a very broad notion, all of which
took off the way China took off after 1970. And we also know that, um, that um, instead, of, instead of continuing on that, uh, on that um, uh, rocket-like path, that Egypt uh, is still one of the poorest countries in the world. And it's an even more dramatic story of economic failure than than Argentina. But the point that Schumpeter was making is that nations make their own destiny. It's not the geography, it's not the history of imperialism, it's not these vast global forces. It's what they do, and what they do in particular to either nurture and encourage the entrepreneur and thinker or else make, make their lives and functioning impossible. Um, so, in 1913, it looked as if, it looked as if the, um, the marshals, the web, the shooters, the people who, you know, people who were kind of in Dickens' camp of um, that things could get better, that uh, we could exert more control over our circumstances and influence and radically change our material circumstances, um, seemed to 
what looked um, sort of automatic and natural and spontaneous, you know, in this pre-war order, had actually required um, um, government intervention and the functioning of certain institutions, like gold standards, like um, free trade, etc., and of course peace. And, um, he, and Keynes uh, made his debut in the public, um, in the public consciousness with a bestseller called The Economic Consequences of Peace, in which he chastised and expressed his total lack of faith in the political leadership of the Allies, who were doing everything, absolutely everything, worrying about absolutely everything, except getting the uh, world economy functioning again. And um, because I think I will um, um, you know, sort of stop with Keynes, I'll just go on to say that you know, his advice was not taken, and he had a second chance to give similar advice in what was the greatest economic and self-inflicted calamity of the 20th century, and that is, of course, the Great Depression, which, by the way, was not great everywhere. It was particularly great in the United States, where the economy shrank by one-third, and <coughs> one-third, or maybe 25 percent of the workforce and the entire agricultural sector where, of course, a huge number of Americans still work is absolutely devastating. Um, in the Great Depression, Keynes, um, Keynes and Irving Fisher, the American counterpart, took, you know, took a position that, you know, that really surprised and almost, um, um, you know, confounded their contemporary, which is, on the one hand, uh, Keynes said, this is not, this may look like the end of the world, it's not, we're just having a little mechanical problem. Okay, we're like, we're driving a car, we have motor trouble, doesn't mean that we're going back to the horse and buggy. What he was talking about was that the level of economic activity at any one time, the amount of employment at any one time, was a function of the amount of money in circulation. And when there was a disruption, and in particular when the central bank um, didn't do its job and compensate for that, you had this tremendous collapse of economic activity. So on the one hand, he was saying, this is not the end. Our grandchildren are going to live, are going to have living standards four to eight times higher. He was not one of those who said, well, you know, over in Moscow, they don't have uh, uh, you know, unemployment. He was much too smart for that. On the other hand, he said, it's, you know, it's urgent that the government um, be active in the, in the one thing that it controls, which is the, the amount of money in circulation. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to break off here because um, I think you get you get the idea that this is this is a story about an idea that grows at, from one thinker to another and becomes and really and really is about is about our ability to learn and to influence our material circumstances so that not only, you know, as was true through all the ages, that only a few people got to be heroes of their own lives, but that um, the rest of us have that opportunity also. So I think I'm going to stop there. I hope that you have
questions and objections and counterexamples and, um, and I welcome you to present them. Thank you.